Welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name Podcast with the legendino Tim Vickery all the way in Rio. But dreaming, Tim, of a time when England uh, recreated the game or reimagined the game that is football. Uh, here I am in a tropical sunshine, dreaming of a bitterly cold night in Madrid on uh, the 8th of December 1965. I see this a little bit as, as part two of a trilogy. You know, the, the first one of these that we ever did was England winning the World Cup in 1966. Yes, it was that, brilliant. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the, you know, um, when Chris Farlow was number one with baby, 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 you're out of time. Uh, that's right. Good memory. <laughs> yeah. given, uh, given that you were like a year old at I the was, time, yeah, it's not yeah. a bad memory, you know. Yeah, I was a year and two months and those two months made all the difference. Um, so that that's the, the concluding part of the trilogy. And then another one we looked at a while back was England on tour here in Rio in 64, where they got beat by both Brazil and Argentina. And the manager, Alf Ramsey, thought it, it, it's the moment when he thinks, no, we're too open. He was playing 4-2-4 with two wingers. No, we're too open. That's not the direction that football's going. Uh, we need to we need to Archie Bell and the drills, man. We need to tighten up. Yes. Uh, and, and this is the moment... This game against Spain is the moment where he finds his formula. Now, let, let's remember, Spain are the reigning European champions. This is a big game. England have never won in Spain, and they are the reigning European champions. A lot of the team there, and the coach, the coach Villalonga, was the coach when Real Madrid won the first versions of, of the European Cup. So there's real pedigree here in the Spanish side. And what happens on 8th of December 1965 is an absolute massacre. I'm going to read you what Bobby Charlton left us. Some of the greatest autobiographical football books I've ever read. There's one called My Manchester United Years and one called My England Years. And I think he, he, he did really well to separate the two. And it's, it's exactly as you'd expect from, from, from Charlton. It's not a rush job. You're, you're getting deep considered opinions and and this, this is what he says about uh, and it, it, it's really poetic I think he says there's a vital difference between hoping to do something and then knowing with deep certainty that it's within your reach everything changes when suddenly you believe you've been given the means and shown the way this happened on the icy cold night of 8th December 1965 in the Bernabeu in Madrid this is the moment where winning the World Cup for England becomes very, very much a possibility because Ramsey has thought, how, how am I going to get this team compact? How am I going to get this team available, uh, uh, able to defend against the best in the world, but also with enough possession to do something? And this is the game when he drops the wingers. There's no wingers here. Essentially what he does, and he unleashes this scheme on the world in this game, it's the World Cup team. There's only two changes between this team, the, the, the team that plays tonight, and the team that won the World Cup. It's uh, George Eastham on the left side of midfield and Joe Baker up front. Arsenal pair are replaced by, for the World Cup, replaced by Martin Peters and, and Jeff Hurst of West Ham. But this is the system. No wingers. And it leaves England with the extra man in midfield. Another uh, a, a bit that, that Charlton quotes from the sports writer Desmond Hackett. Now, I'm just old enough to... Desmond Hackett was a big figure. I'm just old enough to remember when people referred to a jacket as a Desmond. That's a nice Desmond you got there, <laughs> based on, on... And what Desmond Hackett wrote, he said uh, that this is the, the... He wrote the night of the game. This was England's first win in Spain, but it was more than a victory. It was a thrashing of painful humiliation for the Spanish. Gone were the shackles of rigid regimenta regimentation, the team moved freely and confidently and with such rare imagination that the numbers on their backs became mere identification marks on players who rose to noble heights. England's football was as smooth as the brush of a master, precise, Ooh. balanced, and as lovely to watch as the ballet. And as Charlton said, Bobby Charlton says, footballers go through their entire lives without get, getting a, a, a review like that. But how was, it, how was this possible? Because dropping the wingers, he's got more men in midfield. So they've always got the extra man. And the, the, the Spanish fullbacks, the pair of fullbacks, spend the whole game thinking, 
what am I going to do? What, what, I've got nothing to do. Who, who am I going to mark? I don't know. I don't know what to do because England have the extra man in midfield, so they can always find the pass and always keep the ball. And then, and this was vital to the way that Ramsey thought. Ramsey, remember, was himself a constructive fullback. He wasn't quick, but he was very, very good on the ball. And uh, both of the goals in this game, it was 2-0, but it could easily have been six. It was, it was a massacre of, of, of those proportions. Both of the goals of these games have featured a fullbacks coming up. And there's an element of surprise. There's no one to mark them. So almost bizarrely, and I think in cultural and musical terms, this applies as well. We'll get to that in a minute. England is leading the pack. Somehow England, a, 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 a country that doesn't idea that doesn't it's not an ideological country. Ramsey is a, is a is a firm pragmatist, but somehow in his own little yeah we'll try this and then we'll try that. And he's arrived at a system which is ahead of the pack. This this this, this new system four four two. Charlton himself refers to it as four three three because he considers himself part of the forward line. Because he's so free now that he's got the protection of these players behind him. He's got Nobby Styles, he's got Alan Ball uh, and, and George Eastham as, as well. He feels so protected that he sees it as a, as a, as a 4-3-3 rather than, than, than a 4-4-2. Uh, but, you know, in, in this kind of pragmatic way, Alf Ramsey has arrived at a system which is still contemporary today. All of these, nearly 60 years later, you can still play this system. It will still give you dividends. It leaves the pitch covered. And in this case, it had England ahead of the pack, always being able to find the extra man in midfield. So it, it was. Uh, so this is the moment where England start to win the World Cup. And significantly, he doesn't play this, this, this again until the quarterfinal of the World Cup. He keeps it under wraps. Um, the, the Spanish coach, Villa Longa, he, he just raved about England after the game. He said, there is no side on earth who could have coped with this England tonight. That doesn't necessarily mean that the players were better than than the players of the other, other na national teams, but they had a system that worked and was ahead of the pack. And Ramsey was very, very sure that he didn't want the rest of the world to have a long look at this before the World Cup. So all the, the, the other warm-up friendlies and then the three group games in the World Cup, Ramsey plays a winger, plays an orthodox winger. And it's only when he gets serious, the quarter-final, semi-final, the final, that he plays this system again. So Ramsey knew that he had something and he wanted to hide it until it really mattered. This was clearly a revolution. Um, sadly, like uh, Gil Scott Heron predicted, <laughs> the revolution mm -hmm. uh, will not be televised. It's very rare. Uh, the, we are there at the moment of a revolution. So there ain't much of the clips from this match to be seen. Very little. Maybe a minute of it on the internet. Um, well, which is a shame, obviously, but the revolution seems out of sync with, and you've already alluded to, the manager. The manager is an old school manager, a sort of Victorian era, virtually type manager of the England team, who was the least likely revolutionary mm -hmm. in terms of football, as you've already alluded to as well. I wonder whether the revolution was specific to this particular England squad. Um, in the way that Al Ramsey saw it, this was already the model for the World Cup. These were the players that were going to form uh, the key to England's World Cup victory. And this was the formation that worked for them. But Ramsey's a, is a strange case because, and it's very much my old man's generation, you know, you don't give anything away. There is never, ever any showing of feelings or any anything like that. It just doesn't happen. And Bobby Charlton says that it's just as well that Ramsey didn't stay in the dressing room for, for too long after the game because the players are euphoric. You know, Jack Charlton is charging around and they want to hug everyone. And he and, and Bobby Charlton says, well, Ramsey, had he stayed in the dressing room, he'd probably have said, well, that's 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 quite enough of that chaps yes. you know <laughs> but yes so there are things going on in Ramsey's mind that he doesn't share 
you know, he's a very, very private, withdrawn person. Uh, and I've always thought because as a player, he was very, he was very constructive and he played in another revolutionary side, the Tottenham side that won the, won the league in, in 50, 51. It was the push and run side when it was all, it, it was like Guardiola football before there was Guardiola. Uh, and, um, it was very controversial at the time because some people thought it was not English. You know, the, the, the England manager, Walter Winterbottom, he said he got letters from fans saying, don't don't pick any of that, that fancy Dan stuff. No, we, we, we just want to get it you know, get it in there, son. You know. So Ramsey is on the one hand almost stereotypically English. You know, he's a dyed-in-the-wool patriot. Hates everyone who's not English, I think. You know? Yeah, well, yeah, he could use a few saucy words when it came to the Scots, couldn't he? Yeah, welcome to Scotland, uh, Mr. Ramsey. <laughs> You must be fucking joking. <laughs> so on the one hand, he's this, this, this ultra, almost like a stereotype. Of, but on the other, he's obviously more open-minded than uh, and th than you yes. would. You, and often people have said, oh, yeah, Ramsey won the World Cup with traditional English virtues. Bollocks, did he? And the, the, tr the traditional English virtue was the winger. You know, you had your Stanley Matthews figure with chalk on his boots on the touchline and you get the ball out, out to him. That, that was traditional English virtues. He did something revolutionary. Now, he's he never admitted it because it come from Johnny Foreigner, I think. But I think there's a huge influence of Brazil on his football. He toured Brazil with Southampton in the, in the late 40s. And Brazil's already experimenting with the back four and it, it's, it's, you've already seen the fullbacks begin to push up a little bit. Uh, and uh, when Brazil won the World Cup, the two previous World Cups, they were the world champions at this time, 58 and 62. They've unleashed 4-2-4 and then 4-3-3 with a back four. And once you have a back four, once you have the extra defender, that pushes the fullback out wider and it gives him space in front. So essentially in, in, in Ramsey's teams, the, the, the fullback becomes the winger. Only... He doesn't appear all the time. You leave that space vacant and then the fullback suddenly appears in it. And England's first goal in this game, it's a free kick. George Eastham takes it and then suddenly there's Ray Wilson, the left back. He's got acres of space and he just puts a low cross in the, uh, across the face and there's Joe Baker at the far post to turn it in. The second goal is very, very similar, only on, on the other flank of the, of, of the field. George Cohen goes up from right back. It's not his cross. They play it in and then Bobby Moore is the extra man in midfield arriving from deep. He plays a one-two and then Bobby Moore plays it um, across uh, across the back. I think it's Roger Hunt who turns it in at, at the far post. They're, they're kind of almost like mirror things of, 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 the, same, of the same move. But Ramsey, there's a lot of what Brazil were doing in his football. But he, he would never, ever admit it. You know, he would always say, you know, I have faith in English players and, and, and so on. So he's, he's, a, he's an unlikely, quiet revolutionary. But sometimes the, the, most, the most dramatic things happen from people who, of whom you would least expect it. In, in that four four two formation, then, I, I can see the role of the fullbacks, as you say, appearing from deep out of nowhere, um, unmarked virtually. They need a lot of pace, though, to get up yeah. and down the pitch, as you know, Kyle Walker, for example, would be the obvious example, perhaps in the England team today. Yeah. But um, when you, what's the role of the midfielders? in that 4-4-2 formation. And particularly, I was thinking in terms of creating space for the two centre-forwards, uh, but also pulling uh, the opposition players away from, you know, where the crosses are going to come in from, for example. Yeah, so Nobby Styles is, is the holder. He, he, he's protecting the two centre-backs. And this is Jack Chart on one of his first games and, and Bobby Moore. It, it's, it's the World Cup defence there. Uh, and you're absolutely right there. The pace of the fullbacks was very, very important to, to Ramsey. Cohen wasn't a great player at right back. And there was always the line that uh, he played for Fulham. There was always the line that he, uh, George Cohen hit more photographers than Frank Sinatra. Uh, <laughs> that's where his crosses went, you know. <laughs> I'm thinking of Frank Sinatra, obviously, <laughs> rather yeah, but, than know, his crosses. <laughs> Ramsey did it, did, it, did it his way. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, he's, he's got, he's, th that's his, his defensive protection. And if if no one dives in, then that's hard to that's hard to penetrate. That's hard to get through. So then, what he's got with ball is he's got two players in one, because 
Ball can go out wide and be the winger if you want him to. Yeah. And as yeah, he did in, the, in the, famous, the famous goal that may not have been a goal in the, in the final in 66 from Jeff Hurst, it's Alan Ball getting to the line and, 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 and crossing. So Ball is, he can be the winger, but he, he can also play inside and just make that, that extra man because that, that's a lot of what football is about. Ball, see, I, I see Ball as a kind of right-footed version of of Mario Zagallo, who played, he played on the left wing for Brazil in 58 and 62 and was the coach in 70. And he did, did that double role. He was the winger, but he would also come back and mark and come back and tuck inside and be part of the team in possession. And, and, and Zagallo, and I was, I was fortunate enough, to, enough to, to go in depth with on, on him with this. And, and a point that Zagallo made is football is maths. From the point that the opposition have a back four, then you must be able to outnumber them elsewhere on the field because they got four players at the back. So you must be able to create, if you, if you distribute your players intelligently, you must be able to create a two against one situation anywhere on the field outside the penalty area. And that, that, that's one of the things that Ball would do as well because he, he comes into the middle the fullback doesn't doesn't uh, is the fullback going to follow him and leave that leave that flank leave that space open, well probably not. So you've got an extra man there. So Ball is both a central midfielder and a winger. You've got a player, as they said of Zagallo, you've got a player with two shirts. George Eastham is doing a similar thing on the left, although I don't think he was quite as versatile, and that's one of the reasons he was still in the squad come the World Cup six months later, but he lost his place to Martin Peters. Who was who was more, more more versatile? Did things quicker as well? I think George Eason was very classy, but Martin Peters did did those things quicker. So you you've got it. It is remarkably flexible, and you see one of the heights of of this team that Ramsey creates is when they play Brazil in 1970 in that World Cup. It's the same team really. He's made a shift here and there, but it's essentially the same team. And I don't know what the, the, the possession statistics are of that game. But I would, I would guess that England had more possession than Brazil. Brazil, 1970, um, because England had worked out how to create the, the, the extra man in, in midfield. Uh, it, it, and it really was revolutionary. And I don't think it's, it's ever quite been given the credit that it deserves. It's a step on the way to then what Ajax did in the 70s with the total football where anyone can crop up in any position as long as you keep the structure of the side. But I think what England were doing with, with, with this, this, this kind of 4-4-2 thing was a step on the way. Um, you can almost see it in, in production terms. Uh, you make your players more productive because they all have more than one role. Most of them have more than one role. Now, that's not true of, say, Gordon Banks. He's the goalkeeper. It's not true of Jack Charlton. He's there to head the ball away and kick the ball away and stop other people from playing. But everyone else is going to contribute in different ways, both with and and without the ball. I think that that that, that was key to this side that Ramsey created. Yeah, he perhaps doesn't get the credit for it. Uh, it's arguably the same formation, isn't it, that Mario Zagallo won the World Cup four years later with Brazil. Yeah, that they they tweaked it even a little bit more. It was more like uh, a four-two-three-one what they did. They didn't play too right up front as England played with this uh, this night with, with Hunt and, and Jimmy Greaves is out with hepatitis. That, that, that's why he's not playing. He, he didn't completely recover as, as, he, would, as he would say himself. Um, Brazil um, went a step further in 1970 and played Pelé off Tostão. And the vital game in that, one of the vital games in that Brazil campaign is, is when they beat Peru and Peru having a comeback and the fellow who comes back and wins the ball, I think in the Brazil half, is Pelé. They've taken it one step further. They've got one of their strikers coming back and helping out in, in, uh, in, in the midfield block. And Zagallo was quite happy to see that team as a, as a, as a, as a forerunner of kind of modern day 4-5-1. Um, but there, there are similarities. Obviously, there are massive differences as well. And the difference is the individual talent of the players. You know, the, the, the Brazilians can do things with the ball that this England team can't. But if you're creating two against one situations, you don't necessarily have to be a genius. You know, you just have to wait the pass and, and give the right pass at, at the right time. 
and, and and so a good team that operates like that doesn't necessarily have to be full of of, of individual genius. If if you're creating two against one situations through your formation, then and this was a great lesson of Hungary. This was a lesson that Malcolm Allison took from being at Hung uh, at Wembley in '53 when Hungary beat us six three. So the, the Hungarian, they're good players, but they're not that much better. It's just that they're, the way that they're playing, their formation means that they are creating two against one situations close to our, to our goal. Uh, so that, that's the way that the, 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 the tactical organisation of the side helps the individual player to be better because you're giving him the ball in space. Uh, and that this is what England were able to do, creating the extra man against Spain and playing through Spain with, uh, with, uh, w- with an ease that, that, uh, that left the Spanish perplexed. And why, why do you think the 4-4-2 formation has been so durable? Because it leaves the pitch covered. You've, you've, you've got all sections of, of, of the pitch covered. Um, so I think for that reason, it's probably been the most successful formation in, in, in football. Uh, um, and these days it can be used very, very well if you want to play conservatively. Because you've, you've got those, as long as, and this, this was a... This was uh, a hole that English fell, English football fell into after the Ramsey thing. We stopped having any, any depth in that midfield. We just had a straight line of four. And that wasn't the way that England played. Styles is there as, as, as the gatekeeper. You know, and, and English football kind of forgot that, I think, for a while. I mean, if you look at the success that Eric Cantona had in English football, much more success he did in English football than when he was playing in Europe for, for Man United. It's because he just stood in the lines between the, 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 the you know, and there, there was no one marking him. It's a similar thing with Nigel Clough, who was slow, you know, and as soon as sides worked that out and had a defensive midfielder in front of the back four to, to close down his space, you know, Nigel Clough was, was much less effective because that, 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 was his, that was his space. It's strange how sometimes things get forgotten. You know, as uh, we, we did a podcast recently about Greece winning the, the Euros in, in, in 2004. And they turned the clock back with a system of man, man marking. And the opposition had kind of forgotten how, how, how to deal with it. It was something that was absolutely normal a few decades ago. Probably started to die out when Celtic beat Inter Milan in, in, in that, that Euro, European final in 67, um, when Celtic had their men coming from the back and, and beating, beating the man-for-man marking system. But sides had forgotten how, how, how to play against it. And so Greece temporarily at least for the duration of that tournament they had an advantage and for a time I think English football lo- forgot some of the lessons um, and didn't have any depth in the midfield and just had that four in a straight in a straight line and loads of space in front and how about talking of that talking of um, how uh, you sort of manage uh, the old school formation, uh, man marking, etc. What about when 442 is deployed, but you're out of possession? What's what's the purpose then of the formation? Or how does the formation adjust? You know, you've told us how it works going forward. But how, how about when it's coming the other way when you're out of possession? Well, how, how does that cover the space? Yeah, because well, um, it, 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 leave, it, it leaves you with those two lines of four. So you, you've got all of all of that that space across the field is is covered. So when the opposition have the ball on 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 your right, you can bring a cross there. You can leave the space on your left, and if if they do the big switch, then you you, you just move over again. So I think that, that that's the basic advantage of the system. It just leaves and and George Cohen always always used to say this the the, the right back, and he said we learnt we're defending this way. That if no, if no one sold themselves, then we were we were really really hard to, to play through, uh, and um, you know, it's yeah, it, it it it's a basic way to set out your side that you can still do today. And Ramsey was yeah. so far ahead of the curve because he was he was he had arrived at that point, arrived at the point that the winger who just stays hugging the touchline can be a luxury player. But obviously, things come around again. Wingers have come back. Yeah, yeah. And maybe Bobby Charlton was right because it is more like 4-3-3 nowadays, isn't it? That seemed to be the dynamic way of moving forward uh, on the pitch. 4-4-2 does sometimes feel a little bit old school, 
but nevertheless, it is probably still the most. Um, and maybe wings um, have come back exactly because with that line of four, now as, as we're saying, if no one sells himself, it's hard to get through. So yeah. what's the thing that beats this? If you can dribble, if you if you know if you can dribble in the right space, and if you can take one of those defenders out of the equation, then you've got a chance. So I, I think that that's why. Uh, and also with football now is quite compact. The sides are quite compact. So if you can dribble and suddenly take two out of the game, fantastic. You've you've you've, you've opened up holes. Especially in the tournament, you know, where in Euro season at the moment, um, you do have to stay very compact um, in a sort of knockout tournament. Well, in, in a tournament where every game will feel like a knockout for some of those uh, group stages as well. You do have to stay very compact and wait for your opportunities. And I suppose 4-4-2 allows you to be flexible in that way. Widen the pitch quite a lot. Protect yourselves as well quite a lot, but also have that opportunity uh, to break from defence. Yeah, and I mean, to... if, if you look at so, so the last World Cup, some of the last World Cups, Spain, who are a possession-based team looking to create yeah. an extra man in midfield, in some of the big games, how hard they found to play their way through. Really hard. You know, the, the, the opposition just stays there with, it, with its two banks of four, can't play through them. Hence yeah, the yeah. fact that that w when teams are able to defend us and without conceding a lot of free kicks either, no, they just. But why did it take? Well, why did it take people so long to work that out with the Spanish team? Because they had like twelve years of tippy tapping around, oh, you know, the, the banks of midfield or defence. I don't understand why uh, when four four two was out there as a as a. I suppose in retrospect, you always see it slightly differently, don't you? Um, do you, do you, do you think also that in terms of you know like a tournament like we have currently, the four four two is not somewhat a bit of a luxury having the two centre forwards up front. Now, if you can get away with it, you will bank five in the midfield, won't you? And yeah. uh, just play one up front and hoping maybe one uh, or maybe sometimes two of those bank of five midfielders will be able to play in that false nine position and, mm. you know, move forward or on in, in a 10 position. Do you not think that having two, and this is an old school English way of playing football. I remember from you, even our Sabutio days, but having <laughs> yeah, two centre forwards is not a bit of a luxury in a tournament. Yeah, and it's interesting why Ramsey stuck with two centre forwards. I know it was uh, it, um, it ended up in the World Cup being Jeff Hurst with 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 Roger Hunt, and and Greaves lost his place during the first got injured and then then couldn't get back in. And I think the reason for that was they were. They were there in part to set play up for Bobby Charlton. And the side is built around Bobby Charlton. And Ramsey said if he didn't have Bobby Charlton, he'd have to have to go about things in an entirely different way. You know, that the system gives a platform for Bobby Charlton. So one of the things he's looking for for his strikers is running, opening up space, and then Charlton arriving at the end of the at the edge of the area. I mean, the, the, the World Cup semi-final against Portugal shows this perfectly. You, know, you play it long to one of the strikers and they half clear and there's Charlton em emerging uh, at the, the edge of the area to, to score his goal. So he was, he was seeing his strikers as, as much creators as finishers. Now, the idea was Charlton was everything is built around in, in possession getting Charlton in space close enough to goal to, uh, to to shoot. So it's a different conception of strikers that Ramsey has as well. It's, you're not just um, trying to get the goals from the strikers. It's the strikers creating for, for, for your main attacking player, who's Bobby Charlton. Well, we talked of a, a revolution and this revolution, uh, December 1965, is only part of the revolution. The keen, uh, yes, indeed, uh, the keenly knowledgeable amongst you will know that 
65. Are we not on the edge of that swinging 60s revolution? Yeah, we're on the edge of it. I don't think it's fully arrived yet, Tim, looking at the charts of the day. The it, swinging 60s it, are a it, it, heartbeat it, or two it's away. Such a, it's such a... It's such a rich comparison, isn't it, between the old the old world and the new. It's, it's really stunning, I think, this chart. Really fascinating chart. It is. There's a lot to talk about. So let's kick off. At number one, the carnival is over. Uh, and you could look at that as, or you could read that or hear it as a metaphor. It's by the Seekers, like the original Seekers, before the new ones tried to teach the world to sing. Uh, how, how do you read it? It's a haunting tune, a very sad tune in many yeah, ways. Yeah, I, I don't actually like it, but I, they did. Yeah, they did some yeah. kind of swinging sixties kind of stuff, didn't they? And hey, there, Georgie girl is, is is one of theirs. This is it's a very very traditional ballad. It's well sung, um, but it, it it sounds it sounds as if they've almost taken a step backward into light entertainment which i also feel about the number four record cliff richard yeah i was going to say indeed um oh shocking for me to hear him do what is a obvious copy ripoff of a really classic uh love song that was initially written in the early 1950s and was one of those cowboy country songs uh, that Inglebert Humperdinck got to number one. Please release me, let me go. Here it's wind me up, let me go. This is a wind up, isn't it? <laughs> well, it, it's Cliff is seeing his career, I imagine, along the lines that Elvis saw his career. Yes, and Tommy Steele saw and, his career and Tommy as well. Steele, yeah, you're right because that that was the path. Isn't it? That was the path you you make your breakthrough as a as a kind of rebellious figure, and then uh, you, you age with your audience a little bit um, by going into more schmaltzy light entertainment and 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 throw away movies, throw away films, uh, and that that's the path. And it only looks to our eyes ludicrously antiquated because of what else is going on. Mm, yeah, indeed. Well, one thing that's going on uh, politically at the time is a Race Relations Act. So this is 1965. You're talking about uh, December 1965. By then, I was experiencing my first um, <laughs> season of snow here, and I remember it very well. I remember... Did a, did a cowboy suit protect you against uh, inclement weather? No, not the cowboy suit, but I did. I do remember getting a pair of moccasins, and because where we lived in Golders Green, we rented the ground floor there. Where we lived in Golders Green on Hallswell Road, twenty-one Hallswell Road, London NW11. If you know that one, um, there was a slight slope from the front door to the pavement, so we used the moccasins as to. I, I couldn't. I couldn't tell the difference between moccasins and toboggans that you'd read about you know i didn't know what a toboggan was but it sounded like moccasins to me so we slid down me and my brother down that path and enjoyed our first winter um in britain and i, I don't remember feeling cold at all you know playing with the snow and chucking the snow at each other and uh whatnot but little did we know uh, that just about this time a little thing called the race relations act was being passed in parliament um, ostensibly, I suppose, to lay the landscape uh, for us, um, you know, new immigrants or post-war uh, immigrants in Britain who had pretty much a hard time since the Windrush came over in 1948, although I wasn't you know, aware of anything like that at the age of six as I was at this point. But I do remember very clearly, um, you know, the the... And positivity that I felt at the age of six. Uh, by now, by December, I think I'd stopped crying um, for home in Nigeria. And I, I hadn't started speaking Cockney just yet because we went to a school in not a posh area, but it wasn't a proper Cockney area. Did you, did you uh, speak that, in a Nigerian accent come. then? I think I must have. I, you know, there's yeah. no memory of that. I think I must have. I don't think that you lose that overnight. But I imagine by December, so by December 1965, I'd have been here exactly three, four months, exactly, I'd say. But uh, by this point, yeah, three months, let's say, 
September, October, November, yeah, three months. And uh, I think I must have had an accent. I can't believe it switched straight away, but it definitely wasn't a Cockney accent until we moved to bizarrely South London rather than East London. But uh, that's another story in itself. But yeah, I have, I have really fond memories. It was, um, it was summer when we arrived. So it was sunny days, which wouldn't have been far away from where we had come from. And then it switched. I can't remember the autumn. Uh, the first autumn, but I do remember the winter just because of uh, tobogganing with moccasins down that slope that I told you about. Yeah, um, but let's be real. There were challenges for our parents and so on in this it's country. Something of a double-edged sword this is because this is the first, this is pioneering race relations legislation. So that's on the one hand. But on the other hand, the legislation which is which is coming, which is about immigration, is tightening up and it's clearly tightening up on race grounds. Uh, yes, the, the, indeed. The, the because it's in the previous year. Yeah. Yes, it's Commonwealth immigration that they're citing. So, you know, they're not talking about co uh, immigration from Europe or anything like that at this point. But uh, on reflection, do you not think that the way that the Labour government under Harold Wilson was able to pass some of these uh, race relations acts? to protect new immigrants, the way that he was able to pass them through was to say, okay, <laughs> to the, you know, those who would have been opposed to that, um, to say, look, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a little sort of uh, yep. lump of sugar by saying we'll cut down on Commonwealth immigration, which they uh, subsequently did. And I think as a consequence, I'll tell you one thing that I've thought about so much around this issue so the statistics shows that by the 1970s, immigration into this country from the Caribbean had almost stopped completely because of you know, the difficulty in coming over here. Whereas in America, closer to the Caribbean is where people are going. America, North America and Canada my experience of the um, Caribbean community in America, I'm not saying all of them, I don't know all of them, is that they're a very hardworking and a very successful community on the yeah. whole. You know, it's like some people might say of, I don't know, the Southeast Asian community or the South Asian community, yeah, you know, you make a generalization. Yeah, generally, you regard them, they're seen as hardworking and successful. It's a little bit like that. And I wonder if we didn't lose something here, you know, obviously you make, you make your political decisions for the times that you're in, but the consequences of that is that America has got, I mean, in music, which is the department I know, half of those great rappers have got Jamaican roots or Bajan roots or, you know, whatever it might be. And they're in America, they're making money for America, not for us. The, the contribution of all of this is massive, isn't it? really really massive and and people often overlook it i mean even fish and chips that's the waves of jewish immigrants you know it, it, it always changes the culture and always always adds to the culture what do you think it was like for for your dad the experience of uprooting well i will be honest i've seen his diary from around this time and i think he it wasn't diagnosed but i think he had a breakdown of a sort to be honest uh yeah um that's the real price of experiencing racism for the first time because you know you come from a country where you, you've just never heard of it you've never experienced it because you know what, what was the need there was no need for any racism. it, it was an absurd concept within an african landscape um and you know, as opposed to a Caribbean landscape, by the way, because obviously mm, yeah, yeah. Uh, in an African uh, landscape, uh, the vast majority were uh, black, whereas in the Caribbean landscape, there was a different relationship between right, black it's all, people. It's all the legacy of, in, of enslavement there anyway. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Africa is, is different. Yeah, in, in that respect. So they, they never really experienced it before they came over here, and yeah. I don't think he could quite uh, believe what hit him. And, you know, I think he had a breakdown. And 
I think he developed more mental illness whilst he was here over the time. Of course, you wouldn't have known because ostensibly he was a middle class person, albeit living in very challenging circumstances. But the middle classes have ways of sort of um, getting through these things without it becoming debilitating, maybe. And not just the middle classes, working class people do. But I think they have a different way of uh, displaying it or hiding it. And, and anyway, yeah, I, I think it really challenged him. But once you make the kind of commitments that those immigrants made, which was kind of a difficult commitment to leave your comfort zone, your home country, your family and everything else, you can't just come back with your tail between your legs and say, well, no, what a mistake no, I made. Can't do it. Can't do and, it. And yeah. You, yeah, you commit yourself to yeah. this. So, and, and your children are over here now. What are you going to do? Rip them out of schools mm -hmm. and take them to a place that they barely remember at all and so on. So it's a complicated one, that one, man. It's a really complicated one. But life is what you make of it. And you can't look back and um, say, oh, woe were we in that it's kind of okay where were you but now what are you going to do you know you, 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 everybody goes through some kind of uh challenges in 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 their lives and then you got to pick yourself up and and there's positive tunes going back to the charts there are positive tunes in this charts as well the carnival is over is the but number there's one, one just, to, just to, to carry on the link with with africa because what it's, it's not in the chart but it's been released at this time and that's James Brown. Papa's got a brand new bag, which is a revolutionary. Oh, right. It's a revolutionary record, isn't it? Yeah. You know, James yeah, Brown's yeah. been around for a, a, a decade at least, uh, and what he's done with this record, he's done away with the tyranny of the chord change. It's a bag, grand. It's a brand. His brand new bag is the groove, and this okay. is you know the, the records that he's that he did for the next few years. Uh, one of the, the kind of headlines that they got was, you know, this is James Brown in a, in a jungle groove. Do you feel Africa in this part of, of, of James Brown's output? Well, you've got to. <laughs> you've got to. And I, lo I love the way that you described the, you know, tyranny of the chord change. <laughs> we'll come back to that. You've got to. I'll tell you why you've got to. Because this is exactly what Fela Kuti took to create the first, uh, I suppose, international sound uh, of Africa, from Nigeria at least, uh, with his Afro beat, uh, rather than Afro beats as something slightly different is described as today. He is basically mimicking James Brown, but what he has found, you can't just go from Africa to James Brown um, he did go and live in the States for a while and absorbed a lot of the sort of black power movement at the time and uh, the cultural expression of black power, which James Brown is actually at the very centre of. And uh, a tune like Papa's got a brand new bag, which is more kind of, I think the difference between this and the James Brown that you've heard before is that there's a lot more, um, uh, this is a lot more speculative in that um What's the word I'm looking for? It's more of a, like a jam, you know. This it's is more of a freestyle. It's, it's a freestyle. Yeah. yeah, it's more of a freestyle is what I was looking for. But anyway, um, <clears throat> underneath that groove, there's something that connects Fela Kuti and African music uh, to North American, the sound of North America, funk, uh, soul, whatever you want to call it. And that is what Fella took from this and amalgamated it uh, with the, what was his, you know, because Fella started out in a group called the Cola, Cola, Cola Libitos or the Cooler Libitos. It was either the Cola Libitos or the Cooler Libitos. I'm sorry that um, I've, I've, I've forgotten that. But anyway, um, when you hear him, this is when Fella was studying at uh, Trinity School of Music in London. He had gone to London to study medicine. His father had sent him there to study, but, you know, he loved the music, etc. Anyway, he had this sort of, and I'm going to write about this one day, actually, because this is my father's mm. generation. When they came over here, just, you know, you're asking about how they found it. Well, they, they found their own little tribes and their own little communities of people from, let's say, you know, Lagos or wherever. And 
they found a way to navigate the landscape here through the connection. So, for example, um, if you wanted your music from back home, well, there was a group called the Kula Libitos who were willing to perform that music for you. And they were putting out records, which were essentially high life records, which was the um, the popular soundtrack of West Africa at the time, out of Ghana, but Nigeria had its own kind of high life, and that was the Kula Libitos. Then he goes to America for a while, discovers black power, um, discovers an American woman as well with a big afro, uh, Sandra, and discovers uh, James Brown. And, you know, the art or the synergy of the art comes in that you're hearing something in James Brown that you can feel. It's like football. When you bring culturally, when you bring a formation, as we've been talking about, four, uh, four, four, two to one culture it works because for example you need your tall center forwards don't you you can't have little short geezers running around on a 442 formation for example so there are some cultural limitations but when they amalgamate and synchronize in the way that they've done uh, between fella and uh, james brown then you know that you know they're connected culturally so if that answers your question in a very long-winded way it does, it, it does. It, it's it's given me a thirst for for knowledge and i, I want you to write about this because i, w- I want to learn more about it but the, the fascinating thing about it is, is like boundaries are being pushed in all kinds of direction you know as bob dylan positively fourth street it's kind of a retread of, of like a rolling stone yep yeah, um, but yeah. You, you're you're what you're getting is is a lyrical palette that goes beyond love stories. Um, yeah, you've, you've yep. got the Who with my generation and the Animals. It's my life. Well, the Beatles at number two. Yeah, we, we can we, work we, it yeah, out. Forget this, Day Tripper. Forget that. But no, we I think can I think I think, I think Day Tripper is is the one to to focus on because it's the more oh, revolutionary. No. Go on then. Yeah, go on, focus well, on it. it. The, the, I don't know if you've ever come across it. It's a fabulous book by Steve Turner called The Beatles 1966. And it, mm, it, it, nice. it's, uh, Steve Turner was a veteran music journal of, of the 60s. Mm. Uh, and it, it goes through month by month because this is the year where the Beatles just change everything. Uh, and, and the book starts with exactly this moment, December 65. They're doing their last UK tour. And it's just so laughably small scale you know they're driving around in cars they're staying in crummy little hotels and they're playing small venues i would have loved to have been there but yeah, while yeah. they're doing this they, they've reached a point where they have written songs that say i love you in yeah. every possible manner so they've got to take it forward they have to take it forward and they are totally aware and they are totally convinced that what they're going to do now, they, they have to come up with a kind of popular music that doesn't exist. They have to invent it. Um, just you know, as James Brown's being revolutionary in one way, they're going to be revolutionary in, in, in another. Uh, and they are convinced that a consequence of this is going to be that they, they are going to lose a significant part of their audience. All right, now we had a good run, being you know, but now we got to move on. We're artists, and it's it, it's it's fascinating how important Macca was to this process, because Macca's living in the centre of London. Lennon's on his own in the Surrey countryside, you know, um, taking drugs and going quietly mad at times. But Macca's Macca is is going to lectures and he's meeting people. He's 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 with all of these countercultural figures. He's, he's really is a driving force, Macca, although it's Lennon who comes up with, 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 with Day Tripper. So what are they going to go? Wh- wh- how are they going to take it forward? They're a little bit confused and they have to, they have to kind of find their way themselves. Uh, and one of the things that they come up with is humour. Baby, you can drive my car. You know, I've got no oh, car right. it's breaking my heart, but I've got a driver. And that's the <laughs> Norwegian wood, which is a kind of... You know, yeah, yeah. Play on and, words. Day Tripper, where the original lyric, you know, that obviously can't record is she's a prick teaser, you know. So, and I always thought it was about drugs, Day Tripper. <laughs> I well, just thought, it, oh, forget it. It's, it. Well, it possibly it is, but, but it, yeah. it, it's, it, it seems to be a condemnation of someone who's a weekend hippie. Yeah. But hippies yeah. didn't exist. There wasn't the word, didn't exist. 
Yeah, you know, sure. it's to possible. One, in, one inter- yeah, yeah, yeah. Between right, sixty-six right, and yeah. sixty-seven. One possible interpretation is: is this is Lennon having a go at McCartney for not well, embarking on the drugs thing? Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, because he, he was the latest to, uh, to to come to all of this. Uh, and we're just a few months away. I think it was the first track that they recorded for Revolver, yeah. which is Tomorrow Never Knows. Now, Tomorrow Never mm-hmm. Knows now sounds freaky. What it must have sounded like then. And Tomorrow Never Knows Fair point. brings the drone back into Western music. The drone hadn't been in Western music for centuries, with the exception of bagpipes. And Tomorrow Never Knows brings it back, you know, that that, that kind of Eastern thing, the drone. Uh, mm. So th- they're, they're pushing this. And this record, Day Tripper and We Can Work It Out, it comes into the charts at number two, not at number one. Oh, it's all over. It's all over. Beatlemania is all over. It's all, it's, it's all over. And that's <laughs> well, the, it is. Well, that's it the is, way that people it? thought then. That they, people, yeah. obviously, you can't see the future. They don't yeah, know no. that the Beatles are going to take this off into areas that no one has imagined. So you've seen yeah. all these frontiers being pushed, you know, the animals and, 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 and the who doing kind of generational acts of yeah. generational rebellion. Um, yeah. All these boundaries being pushed and in other areas as well. And one kind of lightweight singer, Chris Andrews, he's in yeah. the Well, I'm, I was coming, I'm coming to the album. Oh, Go Bluey. on, yeah, exactly. take it away. Exactly. Well, I remember the song from even when I was a kid, like from when I was maybe yes, eight, yes, nine, man. Or ten years ago. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. it was still going strong at that point. And this is what we called reggae at the time. It yeah. is reggae. It is, yeah, blue beat, as you say, or rock steady. Um, it is, um, and it is. It kind of leads the way into a whole generation of reggae songs that skinheads uh, were into. All the sort of like greyhound, you know, the world is black. The way it even precedes, I'm pretty sure, the Beatles' Oh Blah Dee, Oh Blah Da, right, which right. was their uh, reggae <coughs> hit. So here you got a white guy already realising, I mean, this is the only sort of nod to the Race Relations Act <laughs> at all uh, that I can stretch uh, a connection with in the charts. Um, but you got Spencer a white Davis. guy singing it. Spencer Davis, keep on Well, running. I'm coming to Stevie that as Winwood. well because... Well, remember, I was in the studio with Stevie Winwood just a few weeks ago. You're joking. A couple of times. No, I'm no, not joking. You, you, you don't you, know you, that. No, you didn't you tell don't me know that. that. No, this, I've been to Stevie Winwood's farm where he's got a studio that my missus has been recording in and mixing in uh, of late. Um twice now in the last few weeks so he i mean stevie winwood bought this amazing amazing farm out in near cheltenham um all the land as far as you can see is his farm all the land as far as you can see and then he's got this baronial sort of farmhouse on the one side and then although he's moved out of there now into what they call a cottage but the cottage is probably bigger than two or three or four of the houses i'm living in right now and um yeah, that baronial one, it's got this vast sort of ancient kind of uh, living room area with the, you know, you, you can stand full height in their fireplace kind of thing. One of those kind of, anyway, he, he's got these, what I suppose were stables at one point, but they've converted them into some studios amongst other things. So my missus recorded some jazz stuff there. And you've got to be one of the chosen ones to come and use his studio. Not anybody can just walk in and use it. They've got uh-huh. to like his stuff. Yeah. So um, so uh, Stevie came over. Um, he's 76 years old now. But he bought this gaff when he was 19. You see, he used his money and his sense wisely. And um, he came over to talk to the missus and to, you know, wish her well and how much he was enjoying the music she was doing. So I had a uh, chinwag with him as well. Yeah, 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 Stevie. Can you, can you ask him a question next time? That I'm, I'm, go on. I'm too scared to ask him, so you're going to have to do this. Okay, go on. <laughs> well, because I think it, it, I'm a man by Spencer, David, Spencer Davis Group. I think yes. he's, just, he's just fucking unreal on that track. It's an it's an unbelievable track. Just the yeah, yeah. the attack on it. Uh, I just think it's un, unreal, unreal. And, and sometimes it frustrates me that because he, he comes, he always comes across as really laid back. He is, he is, yeah, he's and, a sort of classic English gentleman now. I there's would say. that fire that you you yeah. you hear in "I'm a Man," and, and so my question would be, couldn't you have done more stuff like that, man? Well, he kind of 
did. You know, like you were saying about the Beatles, remember, he reinvented himself twice and each time he was huge. He went on from Stevie Winwood to Traffic, as you know, and then was it, um, uh, it wasn't Humble Pie, was it? It was... Uh, no, it was Steve Marriott. What was yeah, no, so what was uh, Stevie Wynn's one? I, I, I'll find out for you in a moment. So, and, and he went from like doing the kind of bluesy uh, tunes, Spencer Davis uh, group tunes, like Keep On Running, which is in the charts you, you're alluding to. And he went on from that to then, you know, doing a sort of more heavy rock stuff with traffic and then this sort of stadium rock thing with... Um, with uh, the third group that I can't even remember yeah, now. But, such a waste you know, of talent. Stadium and rock are two words that should never go together. I want more well, stuff like I'm a man, no, please, Stevie. No, please. Well, yeah, 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 but I'm sure you can. It's Blind Faith, wasn't it? It was right. the other group, yeah, Blind yeah. Faith. But, mate, it's you've got to move with the times as well, and you've got to let artists Bollocks. be Bollocks. who... You've got to let artists yeah, be who yeah. they are. Yeah, yeah, I mean, artists are a right. unique animal. You, they, they are, I mean, I know I know you're teasing him. I'm not going to ask him in the way that you asked him. No, but I will say no you're going to do it diplomatically. I'll, I'll say to, yeah, I'll say I've got this mate of mine. He knows absolutely nothing about music, yeah? But he loves your, <laughs> I'm a man, and he thinks you should have done it's more than that. Like, and my toilet's made of chrome. Why not? Why not? <laughs> I didn't know that. I'll, I'll, I'll tell him that's your favourite line as well. But I'll stay never less at a distance before I, <laughs> I, I mention that to him. But, yeah, music-wise, though, the charts. Um, yeah, Spencer Davis Group, uh, Get Off My Cloud by the Rolling Stones. Oh, at Get Off My nine, Cloud by the Rolling Stones. And this is the Heaven. only chart, this is the only chart you will ever see where the comedian Ken Dodd has got two tracks, not one, <laughs> but two tracks in the top ten. He, Number he's, seven, he's, The River. He's ridden the Mersey beat thing, isn't he? So he, you're suddenly, well, suddenly no, being from actually, Liverpool is like, uh, like an advantage. Exactly. That part of it is an advantage. But what he's done is go back a generation to the crooners. So what he's doing on both tiers, which is at number eight, and the river, which is number seven, not the river Merseyside. This is some old school river business. Uh, what he's done there is go back to the days of pre-rock and roll even, let alone pre-Mersey beat. Uh, he's gone back to the days of the early 50s with all the crooning. He could be Frankie Lane or one of those guys on this, as indeed Gene Pitney is with a shocking track, Princess in Rags at number 10. What do you think? No, not not, not good at all. Uh, yeah. like PJ uh, Proby with Maria. It just well, sounds I'll so say dated. It's shocking, I know. Well, PJ Proby was an American who came over, one of these Americans... The trouser split, splitting PJ Proby. Exactly, Proby's. exactly. This is the point I was trying <laughs> to make. So here he is trying to make out like I'm a serious artist. He quickly ditched that when he realised after his trousers accidentally split on stage that, hang on, I could be a, a real <laughs> artist with a sense of humour. You remember you were talking about the Beatles with a sense of humour. I kind of disagree with you that this is where they start their sense of humour. Um, because what I think is they've always had the humour there, you know. I don't think they were serious when they were singing, she loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. They had a sense of humour when they let Ringo uh, do Words of Love, for example, by Buddy mm -hmm. Holly. They've got a sense of humour. He's playing a cardboard box on it. He's not playing the drums. He's playing a cardboard flipping box on it. So they've always had a sense of humour. PJ Proby only found his sense of humour after trying to be serious, sometimes with pop. You look a little bit like Elvis, but you're not Elvis. So the bits of PJ Proby's face. Sorry? Tell me why. Well, sometimes, as every filmmaker no, that's, knows. That's, that's, that's a half joke because Elvis is in the charts. Oh, right. Oh, I've got... <laughs> <laughs> of course. It's not a bad joke now that you've explained it. Don't try and be too clever by half, though. <laughs> what do you think? Elvis is in the charts at number 17 with Tommy Wire, but at number 18 is, I think, the killer tune of this charts, actually. Fontella Bass with Rescue Me. What it's fucking think? wonderful. It's wonderful. Mm, uh, yeah. this, is the, this is the year that, that Motown has a big breakthrough in England. You know, there's a Motown special with Dusty Springfield on Ready Steady Go. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it, it's Wilson Pickett's in the charts, you know. Well, Roy, Roy Orbison's at number 22. Yeah, the given, big o, that's, a, that's a dull ballad, isn't it? The big but, o, but I'll tell you why, why this is interesting. But given what you said about the Beatles, uh, Day Tripper, We Can Work It Out, have a listen, particularly on We Can Work It Out to uh, George Harrison's guitar. That is a flipping Roy Orbison. In fact, yeah, I think the yeah, melody you know, is still you know. straight out of Roy Orbison. So he comes back as a result of the Beatles using his guitar licks. That ain't bad. 
Um, thankfully, we don't have to talk about how can you tell by Sandy Shaw. Let's put it this way. She realises that her voice isn't the greatest, so she's gone down the humour route for this uh, talk, one. Talking, talking of Motown, the toys, you know, an American black yes, vocal group. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Lover's yes. Concerto. And that's yes. such, a, such a freaky idea. Um, it's, it's a northern little, soul, I think you'd call it nowadays, well, yeah, wouldn't you? But, but it's, it's back. Yeah, yeah. With a Motown back. That, that was the idea of the song. Let, let's get a back piece of music from back and, and give it a Motown bass line and yeah. see what happens. And they came out with Lover's Concerto. You call it back, I call him Bark. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I call him Johann Sebastian when we're, we're, we're hanging <laughs> yeah, out. Yeah, well, together. good. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Flipping out. I didn't realise you were that old, but hey, let's move on swiftly. Um, oh, and also, I think we need to give a little bit of a shout out as well to Tony Bennett with the re entry, I suppose, and Lost My Heart in San Francisco. Or is this the original? San Francisco. I don't know. I, don't know. Re- I think it's a re entry in this charts, but I think it is from that era. So it's the original of his version, I think. I lost my heart in San Francisco. But apart from that, yeah, half decent, interesting it's charts. Fantastic. And it, it just, it's a time where, and what links the whole thing together, I think, is both in football and in music and in fashion and culture. Our little island is like leading the world. It's amazing, you know. It's just uh, about to. It's just about to lead the yeah, world, isn't it? It hasn't yeah. quite done it yet, but it's just about to, football-wise, musical-wise, culture-wise, and even race relations-wise. Because whatever you say about the Race Relations Act here, you've got to say none of the other countries have got it. None yeah. of the other countries have got it, yeah? I remember studying um, politics of race in, in, in college. I'd never been out of England, uh, and I was just amazed how ahead England was in, in or Britain was in, in many of these things, you know, uh, I hadn't, I hadn't realized. Um, so I just I, like I, a fantastic I, time to be alive. Even if, yeah. I, if I was only like six months at the time, uh, and yeah. uh, you, you, you were still going around <laughs> well, in your, in your cowboy well, suit in the snow. Yes. Yes, I had a big grey beard at that point, obviously, as you know. You're only six months old, yeah. You use that as much as you can because it's not always youth, but wisdom that is more important. Mm-hmm. Sometimes just thought I'd throw that in for free. The older I get, and the I... more I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the less young I get, the less <laughs> I agree with myself. So uh, 8th of December 1965 is the game we've been talking about. England versus Spain. The revolution that was 442 was born on that occasion, at least from Tim's perspective. I'm sure there'll be one or two others who say, no, no, no. 442 was before that. But this is the point where we're seeing it ahead of the World Cup in 1966, which England go on to win. Yeah, brilliant. Tim, thank you.